Um, so, so the topic of tonight's panel is photographing Black Lives Matter, how photography is contributing to the movement for social justice. In the current issue of Zeke Magazine, we feature a cover photo by Burroughs Lamar of a Black Lives Matter protester, and then five interior spreads from other photographers from demonstrations across the United States. And I don't actually have a printed and bound copy yet of Zeke Magazine, but this is a cover sheet that was just on press a few days ago. And you can see these incredible photograph um, by Burroughs from actually the Juneteenth rally in New York this year. And we will be having bound copies of this magazine very soon. Um, and to view these images in the entire issue of Zeke, you can access the digital version of Zeke on the Zeke Magazine website, or you could purchase a subscription to receive the print version at zekemagazine.com. The question always worth asking is if we're making photographs that matter, that do something besides adorn our Instagram feeds, magazine covers, website galleries. And I sure hope so. And that is the subtext of tonight's discussion. Um, we have two great presenters with us here tonight. Sheila Prebright from Cold Mountain, Georgia, and Burroughs Lamar from New York. And we're very privileged to have as our moderator, Dion Hawkins. Dion is an, is an assistant professor of argumentation and advocacy at Emerson College in Boston. He is a critical race scholar with a focus on racial inequities in health and policing. As a researcher, Dr. Hawkins has studied a myriad of topics, including police violence as a public health issue, and HIV in the Black MSM community. And his national award-winning dissertation studied the mental health impact of witnessing police brutality. And Dion also wrote the introduction to the Black Lives Matter section in Zeke Magazine in this issue. We're at a watershed today in American history regarding racial justice. And it is unclear how things will unfold after these presidential elections um, in just under two months. There are two roads ahead, one with the president who's largely supports the goals of Black Lives Matter, and one is, who is openly hostile to it. One, in, one who's willing to embrace change in America, and one who wants to turn America back to a 1950s cartoon version. But there are also millions of Americans across many racial, ethnic, gender, class, and political divides who are making their own voices heard in support of racial justice and human rights. My hope is that thoughtful and artful photography is as powerful as thoughtful and artful words in bringing reason, empathy, and principle to this debate. And that is always our goal with SDN and Zeke. Before I turn this over to Dion, I'd like to introduce Eric Luden from Digital Silver Imaging, the co-sponsor of this event. Eric? Hi, welcome everybody. It's nice to see so many faces. And I have to say that while I miss our events in Belmont, um, where we can see everybody up close. It is truly wonderful that um, this platform enables us to engage and connect with so many more of you in, in this way. And I think that's, um, you know, that's, that's nice. I, 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 you know, as I said, not seeing you in person, I miss many of you, but it's great to see so many people from all across the globe be able to participate in the conversations that we host. So it's, uh, it's truly a pleasure. I, I did want to uh, share one thing that really surprised me, um, which caught me a little off guard, which was that, um, you know, we've, we've, we have about 17,000 people on our mailing list. And every time we send out a, an announcement either about SDN or something else, you know, you always have some attrition. People drop off, they're just not interested or whatever, and that's fine. This was the first time I had double our normal drop off and uh, about maybe a fifth of the people responded with harsh and really um, abusive comments about the topic. And I have to say, it really surprised me. And maybe just because maybe I thought of my own little bubble of our photographic community, um, we wouldn't, I wouldn't hear such things. Um, you know, Andrea and I talked about this, my business partner down there. Andrea, you can wave to everybody. He's, he's based in Denver. Um, but I will say that we decided not to do a public comment about it. We just said good riddance. So we're, you know, but it is certainly a sad state of affairs that uh, on a topic that is just open and not saying anything pro or con, it's about photographing a movement that people had such uh, critical and mean things to say. So, um, you know, Glenn said it was okay for me to share that with everybody. And um, 
but uh, you know, again, as a as a fine art print lab based in Boston, we we're really honored to support the documentary photography community. We participated with Glenn since his inception and ours back in 2008, I think, and um, Photoville and many other public events. And we've been working with Sheila Pre Bright for a number of years since we met at uh, uh, Look, Three. Look Three down in Charlottesville. Yeah. So anyway. Welcome to all of you. Really glad to be able to uh, sponsor this with Glenn and Barbara and Social Documentary. And for all the work they do, I really applaud them to their commitment to this endeavor. And so thank you to both of you for the hard work you put in for producing SDN, all these great conversations, and for putting out Zeke Magazine, which I hope all of you will subscribe to. Oh, I'm also on the board of SDN, so that, that's why I pushed that little plug there. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Eric and Dion. Um, I'm so grateful that you're here with us tonight to lead us through this discussion. So I'll turn this over to you. Hey, everyone. Uh, as Glenn said, my name is Dr. Dion Hawkins. But for this discussion, please just call me. Um, Dion, I am currently uh, an assistant professor of argumentation and advocacy. Uh, at Emerson College, where I also run the university's debate team. Um, and I was privileged enough for a write for Zeke magazine uh, related to Black Lives Matter. And I was honored that Glenn reached out and asked me to moderate this panel and to kind of give some introductory remarks. Um, so I will kind of talk very briefly and turn it over to the photographers because I know that is who we are all here to see and then we will have a great discussion, I'm sure, uh, towards the end of um, the, the panel. So the first thing I would like to say is that um, I was teaching social movements and protests over the summer. So it was an incredible moment for students to be able to see what they're learning about in kind of a real world context. And um, I don't know if you all know this, but at, at one point in time, there were protests, Black Lives Matter protests in all 50 states and in 12 countries across the globe. And that was the first time in history that that had ever happened. Even at the peak of um, the civil rights movement, the feminist movement, um, the gay rights movement, there were never protests in all 50 states. Um, and I really do think that it has brought us at a critical juncture uh, of race relations in this country. Um, things that I research are kind of the defund the police movement, police reform, things that were literally impossible. These academic kind of abstract concepts that we talk about are, are coming into fruition and bringing actual conversations. Um, and, and I think that brings me to the last point that would be a perfect segue into um, the first presenter and I will um, turn it over to Burroughs is that there would have been none of that if there weren't for photography, right? Because I think what I, I know what happened is that the world started to see so much documentation of brutality that it no longer could be about one bad apple, right? It started to be, okay, but this picture is from Arizona. This picture is from New York. This picture is from Miami. This picture is from Minnesota. So what happened is, is you've got so many photographers on the ground that were able to document, they were able to record such heinous acts um, in that way America no longer could turn a blind eye, whereas in years past, um, they definitely did. And the other thing I would say, um, and I'll definitely uh, probably mention this later on too, the beauty of it is that it has been sustained and that the power of photography is that a photograph alone is enough to spark a memory of how people felt in April, how people felt in May. And I think that um, photography is a critical component of Black Lives Matter, a critical component of protest. And for those of you um, that identify yourselves as photographers, I, I do just want to say thank you because it is one thing to research this. Um, and while I do protest, it's very different for you all who do it constantly um, and who honestly put your lives at risk because I know that uh, kind of law enforcement has not been kind to those of you that are documenting the brutality happening on the ground. Um, so with that said, I am going to turn it over to our first presenter. Born and raised in Harlem in the 60s, uh, Burroughs Lamar grew up as an activist with an early initiation during the years of the Vietnam War, the women's rights movement, the gay rights movement, and most importantly, the civil rights movement. 
Burroughs remembers seeing his own neighborhood in flames during the riots that followed the death of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And in 2014, after the murders of Mike Brown, Trayvon Martin, Eric Gardner, and unfortunately countless others, uh, Lamar felt the need to start to document the Black Lives Matter movement. So he took to the streets with the same spirit. This time, Burroughs went with a camera in hand. Although never trained professionally as a photojournalist, uh, he became a documentary photographer out of passion and has a desire to photograph something that you may know. So with that said, I am more than happy to turn it over to our first photographer and presenter for the evening, Burroughs Lamar. Okay, Burroughs, you gotta unmute yourself. No, you sh the button in the lower left. Uh, let's see. In the lower left of your Zoom window, there's should be a red arrow across a little microphone. Just click on that. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yep, we can hear you fine now. Okay. So, um, I'm not really good at talking about myself, but I will begin by saying thank you to you for the platform to talk about something that I'm very passionate about. And I mentioned to Glenn, yesterday we talked, he asked me my background, what I do for a living. And I work as a social work administrator in forensic psychiatry. And one of the things that psychiatrists do, you see all the time, where they want to go into the childhood of people, right? And it's called a psychosocial. So I thought about myself in this instance because my childhood was exposed to a lot of things growing up in Harlem that are stereotypical of what you would find in the so-called ghetto, right? You see crime, you see poverty, you see all these things. Uh, at that time, heroin was big and you saw people using heroin and it works. And so I don't know if any of you who are of that age, but they used uh, eyedroppers and a bottle cap and a candle to uh, get high and you would go into your building and you would see their works they would leave behind and blood and stuff like that. And so everyone in my neighborhood that I grew up with for the most part did not finish uh, junior high school or high school. And my parents was from, my mother's from Missouri and my dad is from Georgia. So I had Midwestern values and Southern values in a child born in New York City. So that was at odds with their values in a community that was all about take, 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 uh, get over, get over, not hard work and sacrifice. And these were things that were instilled into me. So those of you who look at the, the tag lines of license plates, the Missouri license plate says, show me state, right? The show me state. And so my mother always taught me about show when you make a friend with someone. And that was used in my relations with people in Harlem to show them that I was going to be um, fair in taking their photographs and not use them for commercial purposes. Um, what helped me get out of the ghetto, so to speak, and I hate to use that term, was bicycle racing. And because all of my friends were going on to become drug dealers and so forth and so on, and bicycle racing was a means of a sport to uh, get me from the streets. And because our home was conducive for study, my father was a, a big book reader and he had the New York Times and Time Magazine, Life Magazine, Look Magazine, so the coffee table. So at a very early age, I was exposed to journalism. And at that time, my father would watch Walter Cronkite. And I would sit at the elbow and we would watch the news and see the Vietnam War and, of course, all the things that was happening in the 60s. And then the Black Power Movement came when you were in Harlem, there was a big, um, uh, I, would, I don't want to use the word propaganda, but there was a lot of black power rhetoric. And I was exposed to that. And there's positives and negatives of both. The positive is the solidarity, to believe in black power and black struggle and, and to be together, to be unified. And, and that's something that, I, that came later with Black Lives Movement because they're one and the same. There's this sense of solidarity with other Black people in a struggle for the same thing. So when I thought about this in terms of my life and 
how was I able to make it and my friends weren't able to make it? What was it that prevented them from going on to finish school? Uh, what prevented them from going on to get jobs and things of that nature? Why was I that 1% that made it out, so to speak? That what was different about myself? And I, I thought a lot about that. And when I think of Black Lives Matter, I think of the word existentialism, right, to exist. And I saw this documentary and there was this guy who talked about the time you were born and where you were born determined your, your outcome. Like some of you probably know about, they said they could determine your future by the zip code that you're born in, right? So um, the odds were against me to really make it out, but somehow I did. And I went on to get an associate degree in electrical technology, a bachelor's degree in business administration, a master's degree in English. And I was going to go for a PhD. I had an opportunity to go to Yale, but that didn't happen because I got married. There's another story. But in the world of academia, when I wrote my master's thesis, it was on racial stereotypes. And one of the books that I used for my research was this book here. In, um, I don't know if you can see it, but it's, it has images of how Blacks were used in advertising to sell products. And, and I said, I never want to make images like that. I want to make images that would show Black people whole, uh, with dignity, um, not the images that I was seeing in advertising. So that was when I was in, in a writing program. I wasn't thinking about being a photographer. I thought about being, becoming a writer like James Baldwin and writing these polemical essays on race. So instead of becoming a, a writer, I became an adjunct professor teaching writing for about seven years. And then at the end of that period, I had nothing really else to do with my time. So I took, a, I got a camera and I started photographing the entire city of New York. One week, every weekend I would go to different parts of the city of New York and just photograph it. So after a year, I had nothing else to photograph and I was part of this little group and I asked one of those senior members, you know, I did this project, what should I do next? And he said, well, you should photograph something you should know. And at that time, gentrification was really starting to occur in Harlem or to talk about gentrification was really uh, on the march. And so black people, you would hear with this concern about um, involuntary displacement. And where I live, where I live now, I thought that sooner or later the act would come for me as well because people were getting evicted and being pushed out. And you, 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 it, was, it was a palpable fear of, of people being um, evicted from their homes or forced out or tricked out of their apartments. And because I work in mental health, I knew that was a, a serious mental health issue. So um, again, I didn't have a background as a documentary photographer. I had a master's in English and creative writing. I took two journalistic writing courses with Claudia Dreyfus, who was a writer for the New York Times. And she taught me uh, the class, the rudiments of journalism. So I used that same uh, education to apply to documentary photography. So like a good scholar, I read everything I possibly could on documentary photography and started going to lectures and buying books. And I think I showed Glenn, there's a whole heap of books I have here on photography. And I didn't have a mentor uh, to teach me how to use the camera in terms of from that point of view. So um, the first project I thought of was to get people's thoughts about um, what it's like to be, uh, what does gentrification look like? So I'm gonna share this screen and hopefully I can get this to come up here. Glenn, you may have to help me get to my uh, show, this, show this screen here. Yeah, so hover down to the bottom of the Zoom window and click on the little button that says share screen. Yeah, there you go. Um, All right, let's see. Yeah. Okay, can everybody see? Yeah. Okay, so if you can see the title says gentrification in Harlem. And so, Underneath each photograph is the question I asked each person. So the question was, how do you feel about gentrification or changes in Harlem? And the second question was, has any of the gentrification occurring in Harlem affected you directly or indirectly? And if so, is it negative or positive? And so I used this project um, 
to enter into the Honickman Foundation for Documentary Studies at Duke University. And Mary Ellen Mark was the curator at the time when I submitted this, I think it was in 2008. And um, I didn't win, but it was my first opportunity to um, submit a, a project to a major uh, institution. And uh, this is real research because I never use it for research, but when I think about it now, um, each of these persons took the time to answer my questions. And, um, and I, was, I tried to be as democratic as I could. I wanted to make sure if I interview, if I met a, a, a female, I wanted to interview a male. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is in Hal Sharpton's National Action Network. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I didn't, uh, influence their uh, responses to the question. And um, I was surprised because when I added up or tallied up the responses, it was 50-50. Half the people were really against gentrification and the other half were for it, but from the standpoint, they all felt that Harlem still should be affordable uh, for black people to live. But of course, it was a community devoid of, a lot of, of all the amenities that was downtown. Um, so this is my first project. And after that, I said, well, what am I going to do next? And so, um, I started just using my connections in Harlem to, um, ask people to allow me to come into their lives to, uh, photograph their events, their, um, as a matter of fact, if this website cooperates, I can do it. So some other galleries that I have here. This is why I have two websites <laughs> for this reason alone. Um, so, all right, so then I have to go to my other website. Okay, so I'm trying to keep my time here. I'm gonna make sure I don't want to go over. If I want to get to the this project I did just a couple of weeks ago. And there's this fellow right here um, that for me sums up what Black Lives Matter means. Um, this image here is almost like the flag is on his back, pushing him down, like it's weighing down upon him. And it's like a burden. The American country is on his back. And he's being weighed down by the struggle of living in this country. And um, this image here is coming. And Boris, can you tell us where these images were from? This is from the National Action Network, March in Washington, D.C., two weeks ago on Friday, I think the, the uh, 28th. So if you look at this young man's expression and the hat he has on his head, he's make Obama president again. If you look into his eyes, you can see the pathos. He's not, he's serious, right? This guy is not flinching. I have this huge lens right in his face and he just gave it to me, right? He just, he just gave me that, that, that expression. Um, the same thing like this sister here, and I, I thought about this one about the, most of you may not be aware that about that incident in Central Park where the white woman called the police or was threatened to call the police on this black guy who was walking his dog. I mean, she was walking a dog and he was photographing birds and he writes, dear police, I'm a white woman. And I thought, why would someone write something like that? Right? Is it because he fears that if he's a black person, he's gonna be subject to all kinds of atrocities by police. And, and for him to write a sign like that, and I saw him and you know, he had the sign and I took the picture. Um, and then there was a, a white woman and I said, you know, I wanna be democratic about this. And um, her boyfriend's behind her and she looks very determined, like she's part of the movement. She, and all these people, when I photograph them, they don't pose for me. I don't ask them to pose. I just run up to them 
or not run up to them, but I walk up to them. And um, this is what Al Sharpton was talking about. He kept saying, get your knee off our necks. It's the next generation. But this woman's eyes also captures it. Um, just the seriousness about this cause. Um, she writes, I'm not a hashtag, right? I mean, and there's a lot of debate now. There was an article in the Washington Post, no, Los Angeles Times uh, this week about how the white Black Lives Matter is being gentrified. Hmm. And um, when I was out there, I mean, you see a lot of white people. As a matter of fact, there was a Black Lives Matter march in Harlem that I photographed on 125th Street. And it was weird because there was a banner and it said Black Lives Matter. And the white people were holding the part where it says black and the black people were holding the part where it says lives. And I thought that was so uh, uh, ironic that, 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 um, that the white people were holding the part where it says black and the black people were holding the part where it said um, uh, lives. So uh, my time is up. Um, well, you, you can take a little bit more time if you need it. Um, we've got a lot of time tonight. If you, if you want to take another five minutes, go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to show another image the other um, website, unfortunately, is not working the way I wanted it to work, because there was a lot more work on Harlem that I wanted to show. Um, now, when we talk about images and stuff of that nature, now we talk about photography. How I took this photograph, I'm six feet two with sneakers six three, and I had my camera over my head. And when I took the photograph and I got home, I didn't see his hands when I took the photograph. So when I got home and I saw his hands in that image, it's, it makes that image, it, 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 you know, it layers it, right? And I saw it, I said, wow, what a great image. And um, that's how I captured that image. But this one of those gems that they, you know, they, I call them the photography gods, they give you these, these, these images and you, don't, you can't plan for it. Uh, this is another image with her eyes. You can see the way she's looking away and it just, it's almost sorrowful in her eyes. Um, same thing with her. Right? You look in the eyes and you, and you can see the pathos. Um, same thing with her. Um, well, it's interesting, interesting with the masks. We really focus on the eyes because we don't have much else to focus on on the face. So it's, right. it's the eyes that come through. This is a great picture. I love this yeah. one. Um, so how'd you get that photograph? <laughs> right <there. laughs> well, she was, I was up there. I had all access because community ties with National Action Network. I was able to get what you call all access. And so she was going up to the, to the uh, podium to speak. And I caught her, that's the person behind is one of her, I guess, assistants, whatever. And um, she was walking and I saw her and I picked up the camera. She looked me dead in the face and I had the camera and pow. And, and, and uh, so that's Sheila Jackson, right? The uh, Congresswoman from Texas. And here's Al Sharpton with his entourage. Um, this is way before he begins to speak. And there's Martin Luther King III. Um, he gave a great speech uh, that day. Um, his granddaughter was there as well. Um, and this is, I think, one of my favorite photographs because this woman just walked into that image with that sign, no justice, no peace. And I, was, I just really wanted to get the monument by itself and she walked into the frame. I didn't see her walk into the frame because I'm looking through the viewfinder and I look up and poof, she's there. And I don't know what's on the sign until I get home and I make it, you know, my 30 inch monitor. And I saw that photograph and I said, wow, that's a gift from the photography gods. For her to just walk into the image like that and have that sign, the way it's tilted and, and the light is hitting it, you can read the writing on it um, is, is a gift. So, um, Frederick Douglass and all the uh, Harlem Renaissance writers and artists all interwove struggle into, into their art. And my photography is in that same vein of Frederick Douglass and the Harlem Renaissance writers and, and artists, musicians uh, of struggle in their art. And that's what my images are about. It's about an ongoing struggle for social justice and progress for black people in this country. That's it. All right, thank you, Burl. So actually real quick, um, 
go to do we have a question from your in the chat about that book that you hold that you held up at the beginning there's oh. the author can you just give the author and the title okay so it's white on black yeah it's uh it can, I think it's the netherlands see that um, oh, and netterbeam yeah okay gotcha and yeah. then I know you mentioned you had two websites. So did you want to, cause there's a question in the chat about is the website public? So are they both public or yeah. is there, okay. yeah. Yeah. there's a link you would like to put in the chat that would be great. Cause it sounds like people are interested in seeing uh, more of your work, which I'm sure you would be happy to share. Oh, oh my work is also in this book, Studio Museum Harlem, Harlem, uh, A Century in Images. And when it was reviewed by the New York Times, um, this was the image that was in the New York Times uh, when they picked several photographers to feature in the book. And so my, this, they featured Gordon Parks, Jamel Shabazz, uh, I think Van Der Zee, and I forget who else, but, uh, but I was surprised to see that the New York Times picked one of my photographs of this book, uh, Harlem, A Century and Images. But the website is BurrowsLamarPhotography.com. Um, and the other one is BurrowsLamarPhotographs.com. So, um, and you can just Google it, BurrowsLamarPhotography.com or BurrowsLamarPhotographs.com, and you'll be able to get access to it. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Burroughs. Uh, I definitely have questions for you, but I am going to save it until our next presenter um, gives us uh, her presentation. So our next presenter, Sheila Bright, is an acclaimed international photographic artist who portrays large scale works that combine a wide range of knowledge of contemporary culture. Bright is the author of Hashtag 1960 Now, photographs of civil rights activists and Black Lives Matter protests published by Chronicle Books. The work is featured in the New York Times and her series has exhibited at the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C., the Museum of Contemporary Art in Cleveland, and the Art Gallery of Hamilton in Ontario, Canada. So, with fur no further ado, I will turn it over to Sheila Bright to show us her photographs and her presentation. And Sheila, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Forgot about that. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. No, you're okay. good. Yeah. What I was saying, thank you, Dion, and thank you, Glenn and Eric, for the opportunity to speak amongst all of you. I'm going to go in, I have about what, 15 minutes? Right? 15 to 20 minutes, yeah. I'm going to go into my presentation so you'll get a feel of who I am, real quick. Um, I'm at, I call myself a photographic artist and I'm self taught. And my last year in college, I took a photography course and I'm very shy, very introverted. And the camera kind of found me because that allowed me to be able to speak through the camera. Didn't know anything about photography. When I left school, I majored in textile design. But when I left school, I went to Texas. And in that time period was um, hip hop culture, gangster rap. And this image that you see before you is an image that I shot last year because it took me back to when I first started in photography. And it has the crown on it and it says Lonnie's, Lonnie's hood. And so I'm gonna start off with this image, this image is- Excuse me, Sheila, you're gonna to need to share your screen now so we can see your images. I, I didn't, I, oh, I thought I shared it, okay. Let me start. I'm transitioning to the photo. Yeah, hold on, share screen. Here we go, you're right about that. I was just- There we go. Great. Okay, this is the image that I took um, last year because it really, made me think about when I first started in photography and I believe that hip hop culture and photographing gangster rap actually prepared me for Black Lives Matter. 
because I was on the ground. Because if you, because hip hop was like the voice in the 90s, that's when I started. Uh, it was the CNN. It talked about police brutality. It talked about all what's going on right now. And these are young men. And this young man right here was accused of, um, of something that he did not do. And so this is his front of his cover. So this work really, I didn't know at the time because I didn't know anything about the arts and how black bodies were politically looked at. And this is the imagery that I started off with. And that's how I received my first um, um, exhibit was through this work of hip hop culture, through portraits, because I've always had an interest in people because my background, um, my father, I'm a daughter of a soldier. And my formative years, I was actually in Germany up until the time I was six. My father always kept me in museums. And I look at these 18th, 19th century portraits, didn't know who these people were. Of course, they didn't look like me. My mother would have us on the train. People would touch our hair, wanted to touch our skin. And as a child, you really don't understand that. I mean, you're not upset about it. But I was always curious growing up is why people look at different individuals and communities different. And so I think that's what helped me form myself as a photographer and why I like to take photographs of portraits. This is Scarface, um, the diary. So moving forward, when I left Houston, I end up coming to the South. My parents are from the South, but I'm not from the South. And how I got down here was my aunt had passed. And that's when we, me and my husband came to Houston. I was, wasn't married at the time. And my father told me that I needed to go to school. Because remember, I said I was self-taught. I hung around photographers that knew the aesthetic of photography, the f stop shutter speeds, the technical stuff. So when I entered into grad school, I really didn't understand of how, I said this earlier, how the black body is looked upon politically. So. And so that's what helped and shaped me. I'm going to go through, helped and shaped me as I moved on. And I started learning more about the history. And so I started creating work that I feel that was a little bit more conceptual. And this image that I just showed you is me and my hair. And this was taken in 2000. And it speaks upon what black bodies are always dealing with. is either our hair, the way we look, the way we dress, the way we talk, our names. And, and, it, and it's, it's like, it's, it's, it's constant, it's constant. So I created a body, body of work called Plastic Bodies where is what is the idea of beauty of standard is Western culture. Because if you think about it, there's a lot of, well, most women um, play with a Barbie doll. So that starts to create that ideology and that assimilation into what the idea of beauty is. So I morph dolls with women. And from there, I started thinking, more my mind is always ticking about doing work 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 and after I finished that particular work I created work because I was tired of looking at imagery through the media about marginalized communities because I'm always interested in the life of individuals and communities that are often unseen in the world are looked upon very negatively and here in Atlanta you have a large population of African Americans in suburbia. And I call this body of work suburbia. And this is when I became national with this body of work. I had to go to, I won the Santa Fe Prize Award. It's called Center now. And what was really interesting about this work is I had to let curators, photo editors, um, photo editors, art consultants look at this work. And 90% of them told me that I did not have enough signifiers in this work to show that these were black homes. This is a library. They read, I don't see any TV. 
Now we're talking about the 21st century and I'm hearing this and it really kind of shocked me. It's like, where have you been, Sheila? You know, but this is how I was brought up and how I live. So I'm just trying to form a picture of how as an artist, this has informed me as my work because I'm always trying, even though I may photograph black people, I'm really talking about universal commonality amongst us all. And right after the suburbia work, I created this body of work called Young Americans. And I was thinking about young people because Generation Y at the time was the largest generation in history. And I wanted to know what they thought about politics. And so I would give them a flag. They did whatever they want and made a statement. And that was my first show at the High Museum. And it's interesting, uh, this, these two wanted to be wrapped in the flag and talking about how united we fall, divided. I can't remember what, you know, the, what, it, what it says, but that's what they're talking about. And, the flag means different things to different people. And with her, Tara, she talked about how she's 18 years old when she took this photograph because I started at 18 to 25 because I felt that at 18, that's when a young person, we're leaving our parents' home, we're going to college, you know, we're getting out of high school. And I really wanted to know what their thoughts were about all of this. And Tara came into the studio and I always sit down and I talk before I even photograph. And she had a sense of, I picked up a sense of sadness about her because she told me that when she, her mother dropped her off, her mother asked her what, if she, what she wanted to do. She said she wanted a noose, but her mother told her not to do it. So she put the flag like she's being silent, not just because of her mother, but because of the politicians too. They're not listening to young people or that generation. And this is my father. My father had a very deep influence on me as a child um, because like I said, he was in the service, but how he got into the service, I didn't know this until my mother told me, it was that he always spoke when he saw wrong. You know, he's a black man in a little town way across Georgia. And he grew up around the Jim Crow era, him and my mother, young people, and imagine their trauma that they had to deal with. So he, he didn't care who it was, he spoke. They had to get him out of town, my mother said. If not, they would have lynched him. And I think that really informs me, too, of why I do the work that I do. And I thought about this image of the of the little girls at Birmingham, the church, 16th Street Baptist Church, and how these are mothers and aunts in the 1960s have to experience the death of their children. That's when I came up with the concept of 1960 now. It was about Trayvon Martin in 2013. I started thinking about the young people in the movement, in the civil rights movement, but I wanted to know who the ones that we didn't know about. Because if you think about a sympathy or an orchestra, it takes different parts of the instrument that you have to play. And for me, in the movement, to me, I wanted to know who all the other ones were. This is Mr. Lonnie King, who started the Atlanta Student Movement. And at the age of 23 years old. This is Dr. Rosalind Pope, who's authored the appeal of human rights at the age of 20 years old. She went to Spelman College. These were young people at this time. And I started taking portraits of the young people too, because they felt that they are fighting the same fights that their parents are fighting. This is Bree Newsom, who, took down the Confederate flag. And uh, let me go back to um, this. And the young guy with the um, hat on girl, he's an activist, but the force behind Black Lives Matter is the LBGTQ community, actually. Yeah, so let me go. So it's not moving for some reason. Hold on. 
Why is it not moving? Hold on. I'm trying to move this, but it's not moving. Yeah, we're hearing your computer beep. Um, yeah, it was doing fine at first. Let me see if I could get, let me just. Here we go. Yeah, I'm going to get this right here and see if this works. It's, it so, just moved. Yes, so Ashley, um, when I was in the studio photographing portraits, I as an artist, a black person and a woman, I felt that I needed to go to the ground because of the imagery that I saw in the media. I wanted to see for myself what was going on. And I started this body of work, like I said, 1960 now. And you see Reclaim Martha Luther King Day. The activists call me, they said, we get ready to shut down Martha Luther King. And their whole purpose of this um, Reclaim Martha Luther King was they were tired of the commercialization of Martha Luther King. He was much more than a dream. He was about resistance. And so that's how they were moving forward. And there was a, there's a lot of women that are in the forefront of the movement versus when the movement was back in the day. But back in the 60s, it was a lot of, of, of women in the movement, but they were in the background and not in the um, foreground at all. So I'm gonna run through these imagery with this. And I purposely shot in black and white because I feel that things have changed, but really we're going through this again, you know? And this image of the black male with his fists up, and I didn't know this, that the time is really symbolism with it. He has the United States Olympic team. And it made me think about the two brothers that were running track at the Olympics and how they brought their fists up, the black power, and how they were actually lost their um, medals for that. We are not disposable. And a lot of this work, I traveled to Ferguson. I traveled to Ferguson, DC. Baltimore and Atlanta and let's see, Baton Rouge. And this image of John Lewis was that actually taken in DC. And I wanted to talk too about generational because I don't think, even me myself, I'm not as you know young as the younger people like Generation Z. I really didn't know my history about the civil rights movement. And when I started engaging in this, talking to Mr. King, talking to everybody, being on the ground, I went home to my mother and I said, Mom, why didn't you talk to us about the movement? She said, because I didn't want you to hate white people. And so my, my thing went, I hate white people. And I thought that was very profound to me because Mr. King told me this, he was in the movement he really didn't talk to his children about the movement. You know why? It's the trauma. They were spit on, some of them died, acid was thrown on them, and they wanted to protect us. And I think that's where the problem comes in when it came to that passing the baton on. But with ge this generation, it's unapologetic, you know? There's, this was in, Balch, no, in Ferguson where the flag is under distress. And I saw the hurt, I saw the pain, I saw everything. So with, even though my image is a protest, I want you to see a different side of the protest of the individuals that are on the ground. And I'm going to talk to you now more about the second wave of this. Somebody had asked me, well, did you think that in 2017, everything just was over with? And I'm saying never, it was never over with. You know, BLM started reorganizing, regrouping, going into communities, talking about voting, voting, not just for the president, but in order to get things to change, it has to be um, with these local officials. And then George Floyd happened. And this is a, a hologram that was um, a hologram projected on one of the monuments that they've taken down here in Atlanta. It's one of the first ones in Georgia that they took down and changed our, or had a hologram to project on, on the monument that's no longer there. But with George,
George Floyd, I think that was a pivotal time, like Dion was saying about, there was protests in 50 states and then 12 countries. And for everybody to experience that, for the police officer that had his knee on his neck and he's calling out his mother. It, it was like, it was very emotional for me and I cried. And I said, when is, gonna, when is this gonna stop? When is it gonna stop? And we recently had what we saw on TV with Jacob Blake, who got shot seven times in the back. And if you even think about his gesture, it was just like, this, he's just tired. He wanted to just go. He wasn't being defiant. And this image that, this is my newer images. The image that I have right here are the mothers here in Atlanta whose children have fallen to police brutality. They constantly have to relive this. Imagine their trauma. Rayshar that happened here in Atlanta, Georgia. Then I had, what I'm trying to show is different protests within the movement. Because a lot of what we see in the media is projected images of a black male on top of a car with fire. I, this image right here is a silent march of black men that suited up, that march from Ebenezer Baptist Church to Martha Luther King's birthplace. And I think this is very powerful, but this is not what the media want to show at all. This is in Atlanta. How do you sleep? How do you sleep at night with all that blood on your uniform? Real quick, Sheila, about three to four more minutes, just because I just want to make sure we give time for the audience. Yeah, I'm gonna go through it. I just want to live, but however we will grieve. This I took. I want to talk about this real quick about defund the police. I took, I went to a protest this Friday and it was so different what, what I've been photographing and what I focused on was the police because you had a group of protesters, not that many. They abide by what the police officers wanted. They told them to get out of the streets, march on the um, sidewalk. They did, but they still were, grabbing people and arresting them. And you had the military police, the state patrol, and the um, local police, Atlanta local police there. And you had two men with the bullet guns. And it was more about, for me, intimidation because when they grabbed the other two individuals, everybody started moving out. And I really do believe that, I don't know if we really understand that this can become a police state where we won't have the freedom to protest at all. And with that, I'll just um, leave it alone because I know we don't have enough time. Absolutely. So thank um, both Sheila and Burroughs. So real quick, I am going to facilitate a discussion with myself and the two um, photographers, uh, but I'm going to make it brief. So five to 10 minutes maximum, because I really want to give some time for the audience because you all uh, obviously registered to be here to have that robust discussion. Um, one thing I will say um, is that my uh, knowledge of photography is obviously very different than the rest of you on this page, but I would assume that is what a lot of the audience would be as well. Um, and despite that, I can say I absolutely love Burroughs, the use of um, angles. So I love the, the one of the people singing the high up, I think was an incredible angle, um, as well as the close ups of, of the portraits. Um, and like you said, the kind of fierceness and piercing of the eyes. Uh, and like, like Glenn said, that's kind of, in a world of COVID, that is kind of how we express ourselves. That's kind of the first thing that we see about people. So I think it's incredible that you were able to capture that so well. Um, and then Sheila, um, I also love your commitment to black and white uh, in, this, in this context. Um, I think it gives uh, like beauty to the black body, but also I think it also gives, for me at least, like a eerie feel, which I think is great for what is happening right now because it feels like we're like in a twilight zone to me and like in all of the wild things that are happening in our country right now. Um, so 
one thing I will say about both works that I noticed, I noticed that both of you um, highlighted youth quite a bit. Um, but the second, the, the second thing, which, which is what I want to talk about first, is I love the use of the flag on both ends. But what I think is really interesting is that in Burroughs, in some of your um, images, we kind of had the uh, Afrocentric American flag. So with the uh, red, green, and black. Um, and so what I'm curious to kind of talk about or have a discussion is, uh, um, you know, do you all feel or that your images captured kind of this like paradox of what like black patriotism looks like, right? So it's like, you know, carrying the flag on your back or using the flag to, to uh, you know, mute you. Um, kind of what made you capture those things um, and what do you think those images like mean for kind of the black community as well as for the white community that's looking at them? Well, I think, was it Martin Luther King that said the great American experiment, right? That this democracy is a big experiment and what the potential for this country can be. And the flag and that image is sort of symbolic of, I mean, James Baldwin wrote um, the price of the ticket, right? What price did you pay to come to, you know, come to America? And W.E. Du Bois talked about, you know, the Negro problem. And so black people have always been to a certain degree a problem or a burden to this country. And so, the flag and that image with it on his shoulder is sort of a sim it's like symbolic of, of almost like when you, you talk about the George Floyd with the, the knee on the neck, it's the, the, the country's on our neck, right? It's, it's smashing us into the pavement, the oppression. And so the, the red, black, and green flag, which is red stands for blood, the green is for the land and black is for people, is protest, right? And so by having it right in front of where uh, Lincoln is sitting in that chair, right? That's, and he has his flag up there in the fist and it's sort of like sticking it to you, right? It's like, there is black power, we will resist. And so, so both those flags have different connotations. One in which it's, it's a burden to live in this country with all its promise. And the other one is resistance. Um, so that's, that's my take on those two flags. Yeah, I think for me, when it comes to the flags and what I have photographed is more about, like Mr. Burroughs was saying, is more about distress. You know, it, it's the burden, it's the, it's the trauma that Blacks have to continue to deal with in this country, you know? And when it comes to the liberation flag, I see a lot of that too, but, it's like it's two it's like two different Americas here, you know? And when is it gonna stop or will it ever stop? Are we we talk about the power of the image, but are we learning anything from it at all? Because it seemed like we're repeating history, and that's why I photographed in black and white is not into liberation then I will photograph in living color. I tell everybody when it comes to the movement. Yeah, love that. Um, second question, um, and then I will turn it over to Glenn for the larger Q&A with the larger audience is you both kind of had a somewhat of a highlight on youth as well. Um, you know, Sheila, you had the image, those, they look like children, um, kind of leading with the signs and then Burroughs, a lot of yours seem like, I would say either millennials or Gen Zers. So uh, kind of when you all are doing the photography on the ground, do you see that it's mostly uh, youth based and um, especially Burroughs for you as someone that has kind of experience and Sheila as well, you have um, images from the civil rights movement is this similar to movements of the past? Is there more youth involved? I just kind of speak of, of that and, and why you chose to photograph kind of the, the, the age group that you did and focus on some of the youth perspectives. That would be great. Okay, so this is just one series because the other one, that, like the uh, Juneteenth, mm -hmm. uh, where there are older folks there, 
Okay. So this is just one series, and 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 it's good that it's a youth movement because they're the next generation that's going to take the risk and so forth and so on to keep the, the movement alive. But no, I, I always want to be democratic in who I photograph. It's just that at this particular march, uh, youth were, were in the vanguard. That, that's the same for me. Since Trayvon, it was always the youth. The youth is on the ground more than the, than the elders are. Mr. King says, we have to leave it to the young people. I can't get out there and march anymore. Now, with the second coming of um, Floyd, George Floyd, there was more diversity of people, but still the majority of it was young people. It wasn't the older people. And, an, and another thing, if you looked at my earlier images of, of when I start shooting with Trayvon, you see a lot more women because there was a lot more women on the ground versus males. Got you. Um, all right, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, before I turn it over to Glenn, um, sincerely thank you um, both for what you do. Like I said, as someone who studies this and, and documents this from a completely different perspective, um, you know, it. there would be no Black Lives Matter, there would be no, there, there wouldn't be social movements and protests, I don't think in general, if there weren't photography, because um, unfortunately, a lot of kind of the Black experience has to be documented in order for people to believe it to be real. Um, but luckily, we have people like you who are kind of carrying that burden and willing to do the boots on the ground work and really highlight and show um, what a lot of us have experienced firsthand and kind of what a lot of our lived experience has been. So um, sincerely, thank you. Um, this It was also great to see work from the civil rights movement um, because like Sheila mentioned, I wasn't really kind of, you, you're taught of like the larger, you know, Martin Luther King, um, Rosa Parks, that sort of thing. But um, I was so embarrassed to learn about like later, like young activists like Fred Hampton. I know you both, like we said, talked about the youth. So thank you um, so much for not only documenting our past, documenting the present, um, and, and hopefully, uh, Sheila, we can get to that point where you will eventually be able to shoot in color uh, if you can document the future with the liberation. So Glenn, with that, I will turn it over to you. Okay, well, well thank you, Dion. And let's turn it over to the audience. Um, I hope there's some questions and comments. Um, I've requested that you use the raise your hand button in the participant section, but you're also, okay, Sue Reynolds, I see a question from you, Sue. So why don't you just unmute yourself and introduce yourself. And... Yeah, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yes. great. So this is a question for Burroughs and Sheila. Uh, first of all, thank you both for uh, really opening my eyes, just wonderful, powerful work. Um, my question is, do you welcome white photographers as allies to Black Lives Matter? And if so, do you have any ideas about collaborating or ways that white photographers can um, support or help to support the cause? Uh, go ahead, Mr. Burroughs, go ahead. I was gonna say that um, the greatest power that white photographers can bring is their relations with the police, right? So a white person probably would more than likely can get images that a black photographer couldn't get in the presence of a hostile police. I mean, I've seen, you know, white photographers, you know, get slammed, but, um, but they add to, you know, let's say the vocabulary, they add to the movement. So yeah, that they can document a black person getting arrested or being, you know, violated or some way, that's, that's, that's arsenal. Yeah, for sure. I think that we have to start looking how we look at imagery, number one, because we're trained to look at, I'm going to talk about the media through, uh, through the lens of a white male. And what they're doing now is they're hiring a lot of black photographers to go out and shoot. That imagery is that the eye is not like what we're used to seeing, but what I think it brings in a different look to the movement. And I think when it comes to like you were saying, allies, allies to, to the wise, 
I think they need, I mean, I've been out there and I've, I've had whites that walk right in front of me. They're not engaging, trying to be intimidating, trying to get the image, you know, and I don't know if they really understand or really engage because you're used to looking, want a certain image that they could put in the media. And I think we need to retrain of how we see imagery and start putting that out. It's gonna, it's gonna be hard because I don't know if you guys read about in some of these articles, I can't remember where, where the younger people are demanding that you do not show the protesters at all and blurring out the images of the face. And I was in a dialogue with one of the young photographers and I'm like, you will lose the power of the image. But when I went out Friday and when I point my camera to some of the protesters, I could feel their energy that they don't want to be photographed. I even point my camera to the military police and you should have seen, I didn't show you those images, the expression on his face. So I think that when it comes to black and white and the allies, I think we need to engage and understand better because we have been trained to look through the lenses of the colonizers of whiteness, not through blackness. And maybe we can learn from each other that way. All right, thanks for that question. Are there other questions? Uh, raise your hand with the raise your hand button or if, if somebody just wants to unmute themselves and um, speak up, that's fine too. But I'm sure there are some questions out there. Um, if not, I'll, I'll ask one of Burroughs. Burroughs, when you and I were just talking yesterday, um, I was asking you, well, how do these pictures make a difference? And you had an interesting response to that. Uh, can you talk about that? Yeah, because um, I have followers on Instagram and, and Facebook. And um, a lot of times I'll receive comments like, keep up the good work. I'm glad you're out there. You're keeping the struggle alive. I'm glad you're out. You know, things like that. A lot of positive comments in terms of, you know, I'm a foot soldier. And, and I, it's like dispatches from the Black Lives Matter, you know. So, so that's how my images are. It's informing the folks who, who aren't able to be on the ground and, and actually be part of this, this movement. This, this, this actually is what's happening in history, right? This is history uh, being recorded. Yeah, I always look forward to those comments. Okay. All right, I see a question by Ali MC. Ali? And you'll need to unmute yourself. Yeah. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned in the chat, so I'm um, uh, zooming in from Melbourne, Australia and have been photographing and documenting uh, the Aboriginal Indigenous kind of version, I guess, of Black Lives Matter here. Um, so for those who may not be aware, but there's been uh, Aboriginal deaths in custody and at the hands of the police and authority figures has been a big problem for, for quite a number of decades here. There was a Royal Commission in 1991 into, the, into that. But since then, this, the deaths have continued um, and in quite appalling conditions for Indigenous people. And so um, friends of mine who uh, in an organisation called the Warriors of the Aboriginal Resistance have been um, organising protests the last few years about this stuff. But the Black Lives Matter, um, I guess, movement that became uh, a bit more prominent in the media spurred people on this year. And so there was a, a huge uh, protest here in Melbourne with about 20 or 30,000 people. Uh, in June, I think it was. Um, and I was just curious uh, to know whether, for example, the Indigenous struggle here in Australia was well known or people were aware about that in the Black Lives Matter movement in the US, um, because it's quite a big thing here, but I wasn't too sure whether people were aware of that uh, overseas and abroad. I wasn't aware of it. I'm learning more about it, but no, I was not aware. I wasn't aware of it, but sometimes because I'm a news junkie, I go to The Guardian, I go to BBC, you know, so sometimes an international, um, when I'm glancing through uh, those uh, uh, media, forms of media, I will see something like that, but I, I'm not following it. But yeah, I know it, it's happening, but not to the degree in which you're actually living it, you experience it. Mm. Thank well, you. I, 
I think also I, um, I, I really appreciate you um, being part of this symposium. Um, I'm a photographer, Colette Fournier, and um, part of a group called Kamoinge, which is a collective of African American photographers based out of New York City. We know each other. <laughs> yes, it's very nice to see you and to see your work. I, I really don't know your work, unfortunately, but I'm, I'm quite impressed by it. Um, I, I, I do think that wherever there is colonialism and that struggle, wherever you have the diaspora, wherever Black peoples are, or Native peoples are, or, or people from Indigenous um, cultures, there is always going to be that struggle because it's about power, it's about money, it's a huge guilt that, that happens in history. And so this is, this is a very, very fascinating time. I'm 68, um, so I've certainly been through um, a lot of the struggles in the 60s. So to see the young people, and it's usually the young people who do come on board, to, to see the young people striking back is um, very, very, very interesting. And it you know, gives us a lot to uh, document and to discuss and talk about. But there absolutely has to be a change. And with the killing of George Floyd, we thought there would be a change, but it's not happening. And it's certainly not happening fast enough. So I really per appreciate your perspective, but um, you just really have to realize, I, I mean, I was listening to a young man, I, I didn't know his name, but he was uh, calling in from London the other day. And he just talked about the struggles and, you know, different parts of London and uh, England. And it's, it's just all over. It's, it's where our world is today. And because we've become such a multicultural and multi-ethnic society, um, there's just a lot of more, a lot more pushback. You know, thank you. Well, thank you for that question and comments. Um, we have another question, and all I can see here is the screen name: F. Morta. Uh, it's PA? Esther. Okay, Esther. <laughs> Okay, I have a question for um, Sheila and Burroughs. Um, my question is, how much does life experience play a role in taking impactful photographs in the Black Lives Matter movement? Um, when I say life experience, I mean life experience dealing with, um, you know, racial issues. Because the reason why I'm asking this question is because when you both described your photographs, um, and, you know, with the flags, you saw it from a totally different perspective than most, I think maybe the average person might not have seen it from that perspective. So I just want to know how much to really be impactful and effective um, in taking these types of photographs, um, how much does life experience play a role in it? You know what I always say when a black person is born, born into a movement, mm -hmm. whether it's conscious or whether it's not, it's based on our experience. It has to be. Sheila, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Could you move the microphone closer to your mouth? I, what I always tell people is that when, a, when you're birth, when you're black and, and have, you know, you into this world, a black person is born into the movement, whether they realize it or not. And based on our experience, like I was telling you earlier, earlier, you might not understand as a child what's going on, but it is, it has a lot to do with yours. You know, I mean, I look at Mr. Burroughs, the image of the flag that he took. It had tape on it. You know what I'm saying? It to me it was all about the being distressed. You know, with that. So it had a lot of symbolism in that. And when it comes to black folks, even with my young American image, you saw how the young girl had the, the, the silence around her, but then you see the others, it's not like that at all. So it's very much based on the experience, I think, you know, for me. 
Well, I mentioned in my early, I prefaced uh, about my childhood growing up in Harlem and uh, Sheila's father was in the military and I'm certain that in any military campaign, you're gonna lose soldiers in the war. And so all the kids that I grew up with who didn't make it are like casualties in this war, trying to make it in this country. And um, you experience that. You're like, how come I'm in college and this one is in jail? Or why is this one on drugs? Or this one is homeless or whatever? And I'm sitting in a classroom furthering my education and, and bettering my life. And so, yeah, because like, you know, that, 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 that definitely, and, and I mentioned also about the solidarity movement of living through the 60s. Myself, I was uh, 10 years old when King was killed, but I remember Angela Davis on TV all the time protesting in the Black Panther Party that was in Harlem on 120th Street, I think it was, in, in the, uh, 7th Avenue. And I used to walk by there where the Black Panther Party was. I was definitely shaped by, by the experience. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question by, from Kurt Boone. Yeah, uh, yeah, how's everybody doing? Uh, great, great presentation. Um, you can hear me, right? Yeah, yeah, we hear you fine, Kurt. Yeah, so uh, for both photographers, um, with, the, with the massive amount of protests going on in the United States and, and around the world, um, What's your uh, strategy and what protests to select for you to photograph? And then the second question is, um, when you're at an event and there's thousands of uh, protesters and they have signs and uh, they're saying things, how do you navigate yourselves in that crowd to, to, find, to find your shots? To find what now? Your, your photograph, to find the, the photograph that you want to shoot. So when you're in that crowd, how do you figure out what you want to shoot? When I'm on the ground, I'm not trying to figure out um, what to shoot. And I'm really, I focus on, I couldn't show a lot of it, but I focus on a lot of signs. Like, that's what I do. I focus on a lot of signs with that. And I'm looking for moments where I want to express something different from the media. It's like, for example, I don't know if you remember this image. I showed you an image of the mothers at the press conference with tears coming down her eyes. Those are the imagery that the media don't want to show. I'm trying to show, and then the brothers that were suited up and did a silent march. I'm looking for that because we are so inundated with protest images. To me, there's starting to become like a blur. Everything is the same. So what's, what's gonna bring attention to something different? What else can you show different? And it's really hard to do because our, like I keep saying, our eyes are trained to look at certain images a certain way. And I'm trying to not look at it that way and to bring in different, if I could say it like this, different, pro, different imagery versus just the black power fist or the flag. I'm looking for different images, I guess, in, in that way too. Well, I have two approaches. The first approach is to always make a great image. So I start with that. Um, and like Sheila said, I don't want to take a, make a photograph that someone else could easily make. I want to make a photograph that, um, I forget who it was, I don't know if it was uh, Jeff the Higgins. It was someone who told me that if you see a photograph that you think is good, don't take it. It's got to be great. I forget who, it was some photographer who said something like that. And when I'm trying to make an image, I'm looking from that standpoint. I don't want anyone to say, oh, he took that picture, just raised the camera and took the shot. Um, I'm looking for something that's um, great. I'm not looking, for, anyone can do mediocrity. Mediocrity, mm. but I'm not in the mediocrity business. So I'm devoted myself to this craft, right? I'm, I'm, I'm all in for this. So Glenn, I, Glenn, I talk, I tell my ruin, $4,000 worth of equipment. <laughs> I got in the reflecting pool at, at the uh, Lincoln uh, Monument. 
And I didn't realize my cameras were in the water. So I destroyed $5,000 worth of camera equipment because I wanted to get a shot that I knew that other photographers weren't going to do. Uh, and, and, that, and climbing up on things. You know, I, I, there was a, the Black Lives uh, painting the, the mural on the street in Harlem. And I stood up on the police. The police have these things with these searchlights. And I kind of got arrested for that. But I wanted to get that image. And the only way I was going to get that image, because I didn't have a ladder, I had to take the risk of getting arrested to get that photograph. So these, this is what I, I do. I, I, you know, I'm looking for quality of the image, make a great image, and, 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 and that's it. Just make a great image. That's great advice, Burroughs. I think all photographers can learn from that. Um, we have time for one last question by Kelsey Diggs. Hi. Um, yes, I am very young. I'm 19. And my only question is, when you two go to these protests, you know, to photograph like your scenery, how do you separate like the trauma that's going on around you and your artwork? Because like, this is some of the first time I'm from Atlanta as well. Like I see most of the protests I've been to one, you know, you kind of go in that feeling is just so, I don't know, it's just a really strong, profound feeling. How do you separate that when you're trying to take images or do you separate it at all? Do you just like, you know, go on? I just go from my gut. I'm not thinking about separating anything at all. I just go from my gut and what I see. Okay, so the image that Glenn has on the cover, I will tell you how that photograph came to be. And again, from reading lots of photography books and looking at great images, you always want to separate the subject or isolate the subject from anything that's gonna cause the eye to look anywhere else in the image. So he was walking with his wife. So Glenn sort of, turn that image from a landscape into a portrait mode image. But in a landscape image, his hand, the, the, I think his right hand is raised, his left hand is raised, and the other hand is holding his wife's hand or his girlfriend's hand. And I'm going to use the word frenetic because these folks are moving. They're not standing still. They're marching. And when he raised his hand, I had to turn my body to get that blue space, that sky. And so, so imagine this guy is moving, he's holding her hand and I'm walking like backwards and trying not to trip and fall. And I need to get that fist in that blue sky and I gotta turn my camera and then I gotta set the aperture. And the, I mean, I, I shoot manual. So I'm ISO, shutter speed, you know, and, 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 um, and, and, and I just got to get that shot. And I'm fighting for it because many times I'm almost falling, tripping over stuff because I'm walking backwards. I'm not looking behind me. I'm very aggressive when I'm out there. And, and that's how that, that photograph came to be. It, it wasn't like he just stood there, raised his fist and said, okay, brother, take my photograph. You know, it wasn't like that. He was holding his wife's hand and they were just walking. And, 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 and that's how I got that image. So it, it's frenzy out there. You know, you're going to get shoved around by other photographers or people marching and things getting poked you in the back or whatever, people yelling in your ear. It's, it's chaotic. Yeah, it's, it's in the maelstrom. All right. Well, thanks for that question. And thanks for those answers. Um, we're just at 930 here. So I think we're just about out of time. I, I really want to thank all the participants tonight, Burroughs and Sheila and Dion and everybody who's attended. And what I'd like to do is ask you to unmute yourselves and just applaud everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, Thank you for being here. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you for you. your witness. Great. Thank you. Really wonderful. Appreciate it. Stay safe. Yes. Great work. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. Thank you. I appreciate it. And look for this on YouTube soon. We'll send out an email to everybody to let you know it's out there. I'd like to share it. Thank you. Wonderful work, everybody. Thank you. Appreciate it.
thank you. And thank you, Eric and DSI for being co-sponsor of this. Absolutely. Thank you. DSI. Is that what you're saying? It's called DSI. Is that digital, what digital silver imaging. Digital silver imaging. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Massachusetts. Yep. <laughs> Belmont, Mass. <laughs> Beautiful Belmont. Is that where HUD, HUDS is? Hunts is? No, they're based up in Melrose, Mass. Mm. Bye, everybody. Yep, take care. Bye. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Sheila, Thank you, Sheila and Burroughs. Nice to really see your work. So generous. So generous to share your process. Oh, you don't know what it's like to get your stuff out there. Oh, my God. It's awesome. <laughs> it's awesome. Nice to meet you, Mr. Burroughs. Yeah. yeah, that's the photo bill. You may not remember her. When you gave a talk with um, Ruddy Roy. Yeah. Oh, okay. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, then I'm going to say goodbye. Unless you right. have anything to say. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Be right. safe. Right. Take right. care. Right. Take care, everyone. Keep well. I'm going to press the end meeting button now. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Right. Take care. Be safe.